Ooh. For many years after the early establishment of the Grey Knights, they remained still absent from any involvement during the period of scouring traitor Chaos Astartes that followed in the wake of the heresy. Titan was still missing, and instead the Grey Knights in the fashion of the ever-reserved Nathaniel Garrow would bide their time, strengthening their minds, training, and above all else, perfecting their skills of demon hunting and powerful psychic domination. Maintaining the singular goal that when they would re-emerge, they would be ready to unleash a wave of vengeance in the name of the Emperor, the abhorrent demons of the warp would greatly regret their expulsions into the material realm. Also, as we well know, time in warp space is not that of time in real space, and this was why when Titan did finally re-emerge from the warp only a few standard years after its disappearance, the Grey Knights stood ready, not with a few hundred ultra elite psychic demon hunting chaos ruining Astartes as might have been expected, now they return to reality with at least a thousand of the strongest warriors created at this time. Malkador's Eight had delivered a force of unrivaled power to counter and bring down a great vengeance upon those who sought to destroy them. The Inquisition itself was also now well established by the mortal lords who were also selected by Malkador and had long awaited the return of Titan and the Eight Knights. And so when it returned, they travelled to meet with Grandmaster Yanis and discuss their future cooperation as well as to discuss and update their contemporary achievements. The Grey Knights would now quickly begin to put into practice their perfectly executed training, for many Imperial worlds would soon carry records of mythical silver angel warriors descending from the stars and destroying, rending, impaling and banishing creatures of their nightmares back into the darkness from whence they came. The Grey Knights fight an endless war, wherever the entities and gods of the warp dare to appear, and now more than ever in the dark times of the current age, where the Grey Knights face an almost insurmountable task, even by their own high standards, and as many Imperial forces find themselves stretched more thinly than ever before. They though are masters of psychic power, even beyond fellow space marine librarians, and most certainly beyond ordinary human psychers who are just as likely to be found in a shattered mental state with their fingers embedded in their own faces, tearing their flesh off in acts of corrupted insanity as their lack of knowledge and subsequent corruption of the warp finally takes hold and they quickly lose all sense of reality. In distinct opposition to these uncontrolled amateur psychers, a Grey Knight, unlike almost all other humans, Astartes included, they will stare with no sense of fear or foreboding far into the abyss and see what stares back at them.
most Astartes chapters after the second founding had greatly reduced numbers. But even by these wing-clipped standards, the Grey Knights still have a comparatively minimal amount of warriors within their ranks. For the Grey Knights though, this is of little consequence, because for them, they are the masters of all. They can take on numbers of enemy unthinkable to others, and there are few enemy who could hope to even have a moderate chance to damage or best a Grey Knight in combat, such as their elite level of skill beyond the norm. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that they are not able to be beaten or subdued. They could be suppressed, they could be overwhelmed by sheer volume of numbers or other tactical reasons could dictate their necessity to retreat or even in rare cases be captured. Now similarly to some other mythical forces within the Imperium who are rarely seen or spoken of, the Grey Knights seem to appear usually unexpectedly and then only in the most dire of situations. The more day-to-day -day investigations and administrations are carried out by the Inquisitor's human operatives. The Grey Knight's war is one waged with extreme and unmitigated prejudice, but also a war that is waged in extreme secrecy. For despite the quite open, visible and even tangible horrors of the heresy itself, the true nature, threat and extent of the Chaos Gods is still largely hidden from ordinary citizens in the Imperium. But then again so are Grey Knights themselves and it's worth remembering on many worlds Space Marines are often rarely seen also. The more elite the forces within the Imperium, the smaller resonance they have throughout Imperial society and often the more mythical they are to its citizens. The Grey Knights are a force rarely even whispered about, and certainly not by name, and are all but unknown outside of the Inquisition and authorised Imperial personnel. Forget about citizens, many Imperial officers would barely entertain such a powerful and elite force to exist, even with their devout faith in the Emperor and the Imperial State. At the most, many citizens will be likely inclined to believe these Grey Knights are more simply a heavily guarded militant wing of the Inquisition, which to one degree or another they are. But any or all suspicion of such a force is rare in the extreme among the Imperial citizenry, and this is largely down to the fact that any citizens who have witnessed Grey Knights will either be killed or mind wiped. An interesting and lesser known aspect of the Grey Knights' psychic abilities is that, unusually similarly to Orcs, the more Grey Knights that are physically present in combat, the more they can pull their combined psychic awareness to manifest powers. Each knight is trained to use these powerful abilities that allow them to use either defensive wards or offensive sorcerer spells in combat. Examples of these are the likes of Dark Excommunication, whereby the knight will sever a demon's link with the Chaos God Master, thereby terminating its connection to the warp and leaving it to dissolve into nothing. Or something like the fairly simplistic psychic casting of Smite, which allows lightning to leap from the knight's hand and fingers burning and tearing apart any enemies it comes into contact with. Or it could be a defensive cast of Shrouding, which blinds a Grey Knight's enemies by sheer strength of faith in the Emperor, drawing power from the warp. This will make the knight become hazy and indistinct to enemies as far away as 20 meters. And then of course you have the aptly named Vortex of Doom, where the knight will tear through real space and warp space alike, condemning any enemy caught within this conflicting vortex into absolute oblivion. Within the Inquisition lies a great sense of suspicion around one of the highest honours held by the Grey Knights, that none of their order have ever been corrupted by chaos. This fact, while not disputed, is certainly the subject of discussion among those members of the Inquisition who are so sceptical to this possibility. Some of these individuals find it difficult to believe that any mortal, for want of a better verb, could engage in such sustained and direct contact with the dark entities of the warp and not suffer some form of corruption. There are arguments to be made around the sheer strength of mind of individual Grey Knights, not to mention their onion skin-like approach to defence against the darkness, where layer upon layer of careful preparation both mentally and physically is taken to guard against the chaotic beings of the Immaterium. Not to mention that each Grey Knight's gene seed is imbued with the purity of the Emperor himself. And it's worth noting that obviously the Primarchs were far more meticulously engineered and similarly imbued with the Emperor's spirit, and this didn't save many of them from the corruption of chaos. However, the Primarchs were obviously very different to the Grey Knights. One of the most dangerous pitfalls for humanity in regard to chaos is simple human ambition. And Grey Knights are really devoid of this in the truest sense. They're vessels. For the Emperor's will, no more no less, they seek to obliterate his darkest enemies as an instrument of his vengeful spirit. Of course, the most obvious answer is right there in front of you the whole time, the Emperor protects. And if you disagree with this, well, I wouldn't if I were you, it might sound a little heretical, and those Inquisitors that you'd have to speak to, I hear, can be unpleasant. 
The Grey Knight's purity of mind and body is unrivaled, and while other Astartes in their chapters have done their best to preserve their gene seed, it has over time through sheer volume of replication become diluted and impure. Not so for the Grey Knights, their genetic heritage reaches back unbroken and undiluted to the strength and purity of the Emperor. This untainted gene seed imbuing the knights with the Emperor's spirit, combined with their various other means of purification, creates in each Grey Knight a perfect seal of protection, leading them to be essentially immune to the forces of the Void. These knights are the rarest of rare examples of humanity, a singular individual among billions who stands as a bulwark against the endless waves of horror. The Immaterium and its inhabitants can corrupt, twist and destroy the minds and bodies of humans, Inquisitors, Astartes, even their demigodlike fathers the Primarchs, yet the Grey Knights stand alone as the exception to this. Near everything within the Order of the Grey Knights stands separately to that of the more established military orders within the Imperium. Their chapter organisation though is more similarly representative of existing Space Marine chapters. They are organised into fighting formations that roughly equate to that of battle companies within a Space Marine chapter, and this constitutes eight brotherhoods, each one aligned back to the original Knights Errant chosen by Malkador the Sigilite in the establishing days of the Grey Knights. Each of these brotherhoods will be made of around 100 knights, not including officers and senior staff. These brotherhoods will then be subdivided into squads of 10 battle brothers, which can then be split down to 5 as necessary. Beyond this, the Grey Knights operate under their own tactical preferences and using specialised war gear. Each squad will work to establish psychic disciplines so as to best align the psychic harmony between each battle brother, and this is obviously designed to ensure they maximise the synchronised flow of psychic combat between one another, and like any warrior, understand and read those brothers he fights alongside to know their strengths and limitations. Their weaponry will usually be a combination of psychically enhanced weapons, both close quarter and range, and each squad will be led by a Justicer, a knight rank equivalent to that of an Astartes sergeant. Grey Knight leaders though must not only be stronger and more tactically experienced, but also be capable of leading his squad in psychic unity, channeling their combined mental strength. No easy task to ask of any psyker, and as such only the most proficient and honoured Grey Knights will rise to take the position of a Justicer. And this also places these individuals in greater peril than any other brothers as they're the keystone and psychic linchpin of the squad. Grey Knights must be universally proficient with their war gear to allow them to flexibly take on roles using all their available equipment, be that power armour, terminator armour, force or heavy ranged weapons. There are four primary squad roles for Grey Knights. Terminator squads are the core of the chapter. They'll be armed with Storm Bolters, the standard for Terminators, and a specialised psychic close quarter weapon known as a Nemesis Force Weapon. Terminator armour is for the longest time the pinnacle of armour type for a Space Marine. Immune to all but the heaviest of weaponry, both projectile energy and close quarter, these immense suits of armour shield against near all, and within most standard chapters of Astartes, only their first company are usually granted the privilege to wear such rare pieces of Imperium hardware. Not so for the Grey Knights. They are so important and also such skilled warriors that they possess enough suits of Terminator armour to outfit not just one company, but nearly their entire chapter. While for most Space Marines this armour is an immense gift that can easily turn a battle, for the Grey Knights it is a useful tool to be sure, but it is nothing compared to the skill and strength of the warrior who wears it. For a Grey Knight it requires more than a physical shield to protect against their quarries. These Terminator squads also carry one of the most powerful tools with which to fight the nightmarish entities of the Immaterium Nemesis Force Weapons. These uniquely crafted weapons allow the user to channel and focus their psychic powers through the blade and the weapon itself, and this unleashes upon their foes devastatingly powerful psychic strength that can literally eviscerate and cleave demons normally immune to physical impact in two, to shatter and obliterate their warp energy and are rightly feared by the chaotic creatures of the warp. And it might seem awkward to have to wield such a large melee weapon, because in doing so, surely a Grey Knight would have to sacrifice having, say, a ranged Storm Bolter if you're using a two-hand weapon. Well, not so. For Grey Knights, their Storm Bolters are often mounted on the wrist of their armour, allowing them to wield a powerful Nemesis Force weapon and simultaneously continue to deploy ranged firepower upon the enemy. 
Now strike squads, as the name suggests, these are squads used to tactically assault and capture critical locations and objectives. Once inserted into a combat area with teleporters, fast drop ships or pods, they are expected to hold their location until a main force is able to link up with them. A strike squad might be used when a, say, demon incursion is just beginning or has struck an imperial position without any prior warning or suspicion. The principle being to attempt to limit the damage and contain the threat before it spreads and becomes far more serious. They may wear Terminator or more standard power armor and again utilize a combination of storm bolters, force weapons and even psi cannon. Now the psi cannon is a weapon specifically created by the Imperium to counter the threat of demonic incursions. It resembles a heavy bolter and operates in much the same way except that it fires psychically charged bolt rounds. Each round will also be ritually inscribed so as to penetrate any warp energized shielding a demon could produce as well as causing maximum damage and pain to the demon being engaged. Because demonic entities do not move like physical creatures who are affected by gravity, it's necessary for psi cannons to be fired on the move, and while heavy bolters are able to do this when wielded by a space moon, they are less effective due to their namely heavy nature. So a psi cannon uses an anti-gravitic suspenser to offset its weight and allow it to be fired when moving. This does though limit its effective range and these weapons are used almost exclusively by the agents of the Ordo Malleus. Interceptor squads are basically as the name suggests for intercepting enemy on a changing battlefield situation and they do this by teleporting in a straight visible site to site transport using personal backpack teleporters. These are unique to the Grey Knights as teleportation by the Imperium is not especially common because they are essentially having to push themselves through warp space, this is a feat only a Grey Knight could hope to achieve and not come out the other side, a gibbering broken wreck, or worse. They also must do so without any kind of usual protection or terminator armor which is too bulky to allow the fitted units to function properly. The process requires immense mental discipline and psychic focus to operate safely, but it provides the Grey Knights with an almost unrivaled strength to attack enemies at positions they're not expecting and literally just intercept them. In one rare example, Justice and Malagante used a personal teleporter to travel from a planet to its moon in pursuit of a demon prince, an achievement few of even the most experienced Grey Knights could hope to replicate given the distance and dangers involved. Lastly we have the Purgation Squads, which are essentially heavy weapons units. While they are essentially the Grey Knights version of standard Astartes Devastator Squads, the weapons they wield are more powerful and often far rarer. They also operate differently, for ordinary Space Marine Devastators bring up the rear of assault while targeting critical high value targets with their powerful weapons, but are limited in movement by the bulk of the heavy weapons that they're carrying. Grey Knight's purgation squads are not allowed this role of backstop, they must maintain the assault alongside their other battle brothers while simultaneously choosing and engaging targets on the battlefield. They utilize the aforementioned psi cannons as well as incinerators, which like a psi cannon bear an initial resemblance to the common sibling the heavy flamer, but incinerators however use sanctified promethium in the similar way that psi cannon bolts are inscribed to deal maximum pain and damage to demons. Both of these weapons must not simply be deployed in an arbitrary fashion, the users must have a well studied knowledge of different warp entities so as to use their weapons to their best effect. Beyond this, purgation squads are often required to make every expulsion of their ammunition count as they'll likely be facing superior enemy numbers that could easily overwhelm a non Grey Knight unit. With that in mind, a purgation squad will not simply have good weapon skill and knowledge, but will also be able to use the power of their minds to ensure their shots find their targets regardless of what other battlefield obstructions lie between them and their target. Now this enables them to often achieve shots that appear impossible, firing around obstacles, even around corners, killing enemies who assume themselves safe from fire. To any non-Grey Knight units who witness such engagements, it can often be perceived as a true expression of the Emperor's will and only further supports the Grey Knight's belief that they are quite literally weapons of the Emperor himself an extension of his great spirit onto the battlefields of the Imperium. And while Grey Knights must always be flexible to a role as necessary in the chapter once they take on the role of a purgation squad, they'll often remain in this position because of the high level of specific focus and skill required to operate successfully within these squads. In addition to the main squad types, there are other variants of Grey Knight known as Purifiers and Paladins. Now Purifiers are a strange and terrifying selection of individuals. A purifier is simply the purest of the pure, they are the truest examples that exist of an incorruptible spirit. These are Grey Knights chosen from within 
the Grey Knights, and while all within the Order are already considered to be essentially incorruptible, these knights are selected as being even more specifically pure. And because of this, there are rarely more than 30 or 40 individuals active any time within the Order. For the entities of the Warp, this is just as well, because the spiritual strength of these Grey Knights is so powerful that demons literally will wither from their presence. They are a quite literal anathema. The purifiers also have a sacred duty to maintain the purifying seals and bindings on any demons being held captive by the Grey Knights. They also are able to turn their sheer purity of soul into a weapon against the darkness of the warp, channeling it through their psychic power to produce expulsions of ethereal fire which will burn out and incinerate the souls of their enemy. While a Grey Knight could serve his order for years and show nothing but pure skill and service without exception, he could still be denied entry as a purifier, because their standards for acceptance are the extreme of the extreme, and skillful warrior or not, this won't be a qualifying consideration. Paladins, on the other hand, are elite warriors and protectors without comparison. They represent only the most capable and stand-apart knights, which is a strong distinction to make within the Grey Knights being that they are already some of the most superior warriors in the galaxy. Paladins are in essence the elite warriors of the Grey Knights, and to prove themselves worthy of acceptance, they must not only exhibit exceptional skill and a record of pure service, but they must go beyond and complete eight sacred quests of increasing challenge. If successful, they'll be granted the honour of becoming a Grey Knight Paladin, and additionally be assigned to one of the Grand Masters as their personal guard. The various quests are designed to test all aspects of the Grey Knight. These include isolation in caverns surrounded by spirits that seek to break the Knight's sanity, and he'll be expected to fight warp-spawned entities whilst wearing no armour, bringing back trophies from Chaos Demon Heralds, and they'll also be expected to hunt down and banish one of the 666 most powerful demons using only a Nemesis Force Sword and the demon's own name against it. Once the trials are completed, they'll achieve the rank of Paladin, and Paladins will also act as a guard for Grey Knight Apothecaries on the battlefield, because the Apothecaries, these individuals, are critical to the ongoing purity and genetic stability of the Order, and as such, they play a vital role for the Grey Knights and their survival is essential. As with all Apothecaries, while they are able to obviously act as medics, their primary role is actually to retrieve the gene seed of fallen space marines. And while this is always a hallowed role for an Astartes, given the genetic link to the Emperor for a Grey Knight, this task is even more critical and honoured. As per the original founding of the Grey Knights, the command structure is made up of eight Grand Masters who sit on the Chapter Council, and these will be presided over by the Supreme Grand Master. This system of rule was laid down by, of course, Malkador the Sigilite, when the Order was first established. The Supreme Grand Master, while having total authority over the chapter, can only be appointed by a completely unanimous consent by the sitting Grand Masters. The purpose being obviously that it should be as close to impossible for an unsuitable or the most unthinkable situation, a corrupted individual taking over the role. This though would be highly unlikely because the system is designed to ensure that only a fully suitable candidate were able to take on such a powerful position. The Grand Masters themselves usually have little direct command to their subordinates, because the Grey Knights are such a high skill order that most of their general operations are handled without the need for significant oversight. The Grand Masters often play a literal role as well on the battlefield, supporting their brothers or sometimes assisting coordination when one of their demons of special interest makes an incursion to the Materium. The Grey Knights are an order enriched by their access to specialist equipment, war gear and armour, and these can be small and individual, standard issue, or applied to heavy force multipliers like Dreadnoughts. They also use more strange ritual relics that for them hold powerful strength against war entities. In addition to war gear already discussed by Grey Knights, they're often equipped with Crusader Helms. These are older patterns of helmet that simply give a distinct and knightly appearance, a visual mark of a Grey Knight, very easily identifiable. While many marines will wear seals on their armour or weapons, those worn by Grey Knights are blessed in complex rituals to preserve their strength and energy. If a warrior is able to return to their homeworld with his seals unbroken, it is a strong mark of skill and respect from other brothers. Oath shields are personal heraldry worn by a Grey Knight, and these are another visually distinctive trait, with the only comparison being the respected houses of the Imperial Knights. Oath shields can also be updated to include elevated standing of achievement within the chapter. Now the Codicium Aeternum is a book, a dread tome, containing the Grey Knights and also Ordo Malleus's knowledge on many demons the Order have faced and defeated. 
strewn across pages of insanity that to witness this could easily lose a human mortal their mind, are penned residual information, recorded calculations on where and how these dark entities may manifest and how they can be defeated. For Grey Knights, it's not uncommon for them to use very physical relics of past Grey Knights or martyred devout members of the Imperial cult, and to that end they may use the very blood and bones of past Grey Knights, and this can be seen in various relics or mounted on their armour. These wards are often felt so strongly by demons as to be completely intolerable. For a demon, the psychic energy expelled by such relics penetrates their spirit like nuclear fire and feel as if their ethereal skin is being stripped away layers at a time by white-hot energy. Now the Liber Demonica is another arcane book containing script from the Librarium Demonica on the Grey Knight's homeworld of Titan, but these books are mounted on a Grey Knight's chestplate and carried into every battle they fight in. The books themselves are powerful psychic talismans and the spine of each book is carved from the bones of a martyred saint of the Imperial cult. Above all else, they are an icon representing the incorruptible human faith in the Emperor of Mankind, and this in itself is a shivering weapon against the forces of chaos and the war. The Nemesis banner is soaked in the blood of a dozen Grand Masters, and is one of the Grey Knight's most powerful relics. A heavy tool against the abominations of the warp, its psychic fire burns with such an intensity that demons can barely tolerate its presence. To them, it has extreme psychic radiation, and the nearer it is to them, the more powerful they feel its visceral psychic heat penetrating their spirit and slowly burning them out of existence. Now, Aegis Dreadnoughts are noteworthy simply because they are rarer than ordinary Dreadnoughts. Their armour, as with standard Grey Knight Aegis armour, is more effective at protecting against the demonic entities of the warp. And another interesting point of note is that unlike other Space Marine chapters who consider consignment to a Dreadnought a high honour to continue in the service of the Emperor, Grey Knights perhaps quite surprisingly consider their dedication and interpretation of the role they play as the extensions of the Emperor himself, they prefer not to be in interred in a dreadnought, but to instead find rest in the dead fields of Titan alongside the greatest of the chapter heroes. For this reason only the very highest of skilled Grey Knight warriors will be placed inside a dreadnought, often a Grand Master. Because of this a Grey Knight dreadnought may also take on the role of a battlefield commander. And while it's true that dreadnoughts are nearly always ancient and can bring much wisdom and tactical knowledge to their active brothers on any battlefield, it's not common for them to take a command role, but again, not so in the Grey Knights. Lastly, Dread Knights, and this is a very unusual piece of hardware that is exclusively used by the Grey Knights. It's essentially a powerful exoskeleton to allow a Grey Knight Space Marine to combat the most powerful demons one-on-one. -on -one. Now these will usually only be required when fighting a greater demon of chaos or a demon prince, who while still ethereal warp creations have massive physical strength. The amazing feature of a Dread Knight is that unlike Dreadnoughts which are lumbering and slow, a Dread Knight enables its user to fight with much of the agility and skill of a standard marine or human. Also instead of their arms and fists being replaced by mounted weapons as per Dreadnoughts, a Dread Knight has much more close replication to standard human appendages and so they have the ability to grip and use different force weapons as well as having bolters mounted on their wrist similarly to ordinarily armoured Grey Knights. This agility is highly necessary, not only for attack and also defence, as unlike a Dreadnought which is very heavily armoured to compensate for its trudging speed, a Dreadnought operator is far more exposed even whilst wearing his own personal armour. So the need to be able to move with more dexterity is very necessary to ensure the user is not simply ripped from the machine and torn asunder. As with most other Astartes chapters, the Grey Knights use starships to travel through the galaxy. But unlike most other chapters of Space Marine, they have much more unique adaptation, as is fairly consistent with much of the Grey Knight's hardware. Their ships, for example, are modified with anti-demonic wards, and this gives these ships additional protection while travelling through the warp. Although given the crew complement, it's surprising that demons would even want to go near them. Their ships have more armour, and all are equipped with teleportation devices and have upgraded engines as well. They contain larger drop pods to enable heavier deployment of units, and any necessary mortal humans crewing the ship are mind wiped without exception to reduce any possible chaos corruption. These necessary human crew members also have the fun time of being psychically implanted with a key word that will shut down their nervous system should the vessel be contaminated by chaos, and this would obviously result in their mass simultaneous deaths instantly. 
Now why is it that the Grey Knights get all of these specialist technical upgrades? All of these advanced upgrades seem very unusual when you consider the general lack of such a thing throughout Imperial forces. Well for one thing the Grey Knights are blessed by their close proximity to Mars, the home forge world of the Mechanicus, and as such this gives them close access to technology not found anywhere else in the Imperium. They're also only able to access this technology because of their extremely powerful position as the militant wing of the Ordo Malleus, which commands authority arguably as powerful as the Emperor himself. Now lastly, as we look at one of the most powerful orders in the Imperium, I want to speak to something that often seems unbelievable or even contradictory. Now it is established that few have ever laid eyes on a Grey Knight and have not either been mind wiped, executed, or in some cases planets even considered for exterminatus. Although not on the site of a Grey Knight, but still it's within the power of the Grey Knights to do such a thing. Grey Knights are a heavily secretive order ever since their inception, and this is one of the most fundamental principles of the Grey Knights, but why? On the face of it you could consider it as being even a positive, morale boosting piece of knowledge that Imperial citizens know they have these superhuman demon killing Astartes on their side, except for the fact that the reason for the secrecy is that it is still considered that humanity in terms of the citizenry are largely unaware of chaos itself and certainly of demons. Now this itself might seem on the face of it unbelievable for several reasons. When you consider the fact that not only has chaos been around and continually harassing humanity for so long, but events like the Horus Heresy and the subsequent rift after 999 in Millennium 41. Even before that various crusades by chaos marines and so on. So the obvious conclusion is surely that your average imperial citizen has some semblance of the dark powers of the warp. But the question is, is it much beyond that? Education is not something higher on the agenda of the Imperium and many citizens are going to live very, very constrained lives. It's very likely that any weird things ordinary citizens have seen are easily attributed to magic or the like. And there's a very real reason as well as to why the Imperium in general continues to attempt to suppress against the general population having a knowledge of chaos. It's been continually debated that the Emperor could have been better off to give his Space Marines knowledge of chaos so as to better protect them against being caught off guard by this and as they ultimately were slowly manipulated. It's questionable if this same truth would be more beneficial or more harmful to your average citizen. It's fairly established that humans are not exactly the best at controlling either their emotions or their ambitions and all of these things chaos seeks to exploit already. So allowing widespread knowledge to humans who probably do not have especially great day to day lives that there are magical beings who can make you powerful and well, mortal yeah. seems fundamentally a bad idea. The key thing for me is that while guardsmen and such may through their combat experience, that's if they live long enough to have any combat experience, may have some vague understanding of what it is that they're fighting, they probably don't understand its true nature. And this is the heart of the matter. When you hear talk of innocence being purged or mind wiped because they've been exposed to chaos, it's not that they've seen some other human heretics or traitors or even mutated citizens who were corrupted by chaos. These things can just be explained away by say the Ecclesiarchy or the Inquisition. What I believe draws a line is literal oh, yeah. demonic incursion. And can this is where you corrupted. similarly would be far more likely to encounter say a Grey Knight and not just standard Imperial forces. Which is why Grey Knights are then also quick to dismiss human civilians who may have witnessed them as well. Their reasoning for doing so being our understanding of the true nature of chaos. It's important to keep in mind that those who are regularly fighting the truest forces of chaos are hardened Astartes or fanatical devout worshippers of the Emperor. But these individuals have significantly hardened minds and even then are not immune and could be also mind scoured equally after witnessing a true yeah. demonic incursion that has been defeated by the Grey Knights. So your average Imperial pleb is going to have their soul burned out by even the simplest glance upon a true entity of the chaotic realm. That is unless they somehow have the strength of spirit to remain immune and then they're likely going to be taken away by the Inquisition or Grey Knights to assist in some capacity. The rest of any survivors would be mind wiped or just executed. 
Now it's also worth, as with anything, keeping it in context and remembering that this is a society in which millions are sacrificed for various reasons on a pretty regular basis. To dispose of a few hundred or even a few thousand civilians to ensure that there is not an off chance that one situation, once you've left a planet which suffered an incursion by chaos, you leave that one person who gazed into the endless void eyes of a demon of the Immaterium, you leave that person to potentially then incubate the seed of chaotic corruption and then years later that planet suffers the nightmare of a ritually summoned horde of demons from the warp spreading across the entire planet and leading it down a path of possible exterminators. Why would you take that chance? For the Grey Knights and the Inquisition, the choice is not even a choice. Weighing the lives of a few hundred against potentially billions, those unfortunate souls are going to be purged. It's horrific and unfortunate, but it's the reality of life in the 41st millennium. The Grey Knights' policy of mind wiping any citizens who witness them, or in the case of unauthorized Imperial personnel, perhaps at best swearing them to secrecy, probably only in the case of other Astartes, their reasons are fairly straightforward. For one, it's the Emperor's wish that they were born as a secret wing of the Ordo Malleus, and secondly, it's simply a case of ensuring the less is known of them and their purposes the better. Not to mention that in actuality, the chances of ordinary citizens running into Grey Knights is very minimal. When you consider most humans would unlikely even encounter an ordinary Astartes, and Grey Knights are far rarer, and usually will only appear yeah. when there is an actual demonic incursion taking place, they're not just walking around. So for the very few times where other Imperial forces may encounter them, the answer really is why wouldn't they mind wipe these people and just play it safe? The whole excessive secrecy of the Grey Knights though ultimately seems a little unnecessary. If your ordinary citizen were to see a Grey Knight, they could Very easily powerful, simply be told, like. hey, it's a space marine, now get back to your backbreaking work. This would likely be more than explanation enough, and anyone seeing them in action would be already mind wiped or executed as we discussed. So as for any ongoing awareness of chaos by the Imperium, this also seems to be in the general sphere a losing battle. And it is worrying that if when large populations start to become aware of what chaos means, what this could lead to or mean for the Imperium, because having the galaxy ripped in half is a pretty hard one to spin. Yet this is the Imperium of Man and propaganda is a powerful thing. In the current time of the Imperium, humanity faces one of the most severe threats to its survival that has been since either the Age of Strife or the Heresy. For the Grey Knights, this is the very role they were destined for and that perhaps the Emperor even understood they were needed for. Aldrich Voldus is but one example of the necessity of such a force within the Imperium. A veteran of many campaigns, he would assist the Ultramarines in defending their homeworld and resurrecting their Primarch. Robert Gulliman. A summary follows of his involvement with these events where he would play a strong supporting role to the Ultramarine's Primarch. After the fall of Cadia, the traitorous forces of Chaos had learned that Archmagus Belisarius Call had escaped and was making his way to Macrag, the Ultramarine's homeworld. While Call was attempting to resurrect Gulliman, the Chaos traitors known as the Black Legion, formerly the Lunar Wolves and Sons of Horus, would launch a springboarding assault from Cadia fearing what the Loyalist Ultramarines were attempting to do with the aid of Kaul. The Brotherhood of the Grey Knights commanded by Aldric Voldus would aid in defending the Ultramarines homeworld and the various battles around there at the time. After the Primarch Gulliman was successfully resurrected, Ooh, Voldus and his Grey Knights became resur instrumental in the strategy to retake <laughs> Macrag and Ultramarine traitors. This campaign though would unfortunately 
take many months as warp storms continued to rage and the loyalist forces were bogged down as many of the mortal soldiers fighting for the ultramar system became stricken by an affliction weeping. known as the weeping for little apparent reason soldiers fighting against chaos incursions would find that their eyes began to weep stinking foul tears that would soon gum up their eyes like glue leaving them forced open and soon this would turn them raw or oozing pus and then ultimately Ooh. rot out of their sockets. Gross. Gulliman however discovered that wherever he was present these soldiers would become mysteriously healed so this would lead him on an endless journey between stations in the system to heal his warriors and this significantly drew his attention away from the larger conflict occurring between chaos and his loyalist forces. However, over time it became apparent that after he had left a region, symptoms could often return to the unfortunate victims. All the while, these delays were allowing for time to pass, time the loyalists could ill afford, as the warp storms continued to worsen around the Ultramar system, and the navigators of starships were soon beginning to suspect, and even voice aloud, that if the conflict wasn't resolved soon, all warp travel in and out of Ultramar could be entirely cut off, and the system would be left isolated from the wider that galaxy, a situation that was entirely untenable to the loyalists. This is where Aldrich Voldus would play a most key role in confronting Gilliman, something that's doubtful any of his own ultramarines would have had the knowledge or the strength of will to do. In a heated confrontation, Voldus would force Gilliman to understand that this plague sweeping the system was a deliberate waste of his time, that he was not in fact healing these suffering warriors, but that he had been played for time by the Chaos God Nurgle. Voldus could see through the plot being employed by the Chaos God to blight the mortal forces, and the Gulliman had not in fact been healing his forces, but the Nurgle was merely pulling back their symptoms only to then reinstigate them yeah. once Gulliman had left their vicinity. Knowing the strength of the Ultramarines, emboldened by the return of their Primarch, this had been the Chaos Power's plan all along to delay their victory and success, and instead keep them contained within their own system. The knowledge and strength of actions initiated by Voldus as a Grey Knight would lead the Primarch to set out on a great crusade to terror. He had no intention of repeating his past mistakes during the heresy and reaching terror too late something which had led to the near mortal wounding of the Emperor and something which clearly still played on the mind of the Ultramarines Primarch. Voldus and his third brotherhood of Grey Knights would join the Primarch and the first, second and third companies of the Ultramarines to Terra itself. But on this journey the entourage would face more than several attempts by Chaos to dissuade them from their plan or outright stop them from reaching their destination. Unstable warp tides becoming trapped in the maelstrom of the warp itself as an ambush orchestrated by the Thousand Suns Primarch oh, Magnus, Magnus the Red. Battles with traitorous warships and encountering many horrors of the Immaterium. They were stranded with no light of the Astronomicon to guide them back to real space. But the fleet locating some faint transmissions from a moon, friend or foe, they were trapped in the Immaterium and this was an opportunity they had to seize upon. However, what they would find was no saviour, but in fact a fortified installation in a range of mountains. Gulliman would lead an attack, discovering in their disgust that this place was in fact inhabited by renegade marines known as the Red Corsairs. The Primarch being in no mood for this, the battle was raging and brief, and Grey Knight Master Aldrich Voldus provided Dread Knights who would slaughter wow. their renegade leadership. The journey would continue to be difficult, encountering countless more traitor marines, as well as encountering warp phantoms that would begin to drain holy energy from the most sacred relics of the ultramarines, their war gear and scrolls. The Grey Knights and Voldus, being more than capable to deal with such an unusual threat, teleported between the multiple loyalist shrines, fighting alongside the ultramarines' exasperated chaplains, the Grey Knights would use their experience to banish these warp entities back into the void. An ever worsening situation, the Imperial forces would become unbelievably then captured by a combined massive force of powerful demons and renegade Red Corsairs. Even the Primarch himself had been captured by means of chaotic spells and seeds of exploitative doubt sown by whispers from chaos demons wow. through the journey thus far. The Loyalists would then be taken to the Corsairs stronghold, an ancient Blackstone fortress. How the fortress could have found its way into the maelstrom, none of the loyalist marines could fathom. 
this force of Astartes Skatarian Grey Knights now found themselves at the unfortunate pleasures of the Chaos forces, trapped in psychically sealed cells and bound by adamantium restraints. But the Chaos forces didn't want these loyalists dead yet, and certainly not the Primarch, because their souls were still too rich a source of power for the war. As is often the case for the forces of Chaos, who are ever part of the God's Great Game, this instance wouldn't be any exception. For as those within the Blackstone Fortress would suddenly be then caught totally off guard as followers of the God Rage War and Bloodletting Corn wow. would descend on the fortress. While the Zinch and Corn followers would now fight amongst themselves, Gulliman seized an opportunity to escape was coming into clarity. And this is where a troop of figures would infiltrate the fortress from its central core. Unseen by its preoccupied chaotic forces, these figures would move quickly and quietly through the vast corridors of the ancient alien fortress. The Corsairs guarding Gulliman and other critical figures like Cole and Voldus though, had the only entrance to the sorceress prisons guarded securely. Yet the mysterious figures slipped into the chambers from unseen side entrances. It was only when the Corsairs were suddenly and brutally engaged with whirling blades and decapitating eviscerations that it became clear who had penetrated their defences, the Eldar subset known as uh. the Harlequins. Limbs strewn across the floors, internal organs turned to soup in seconds thanks to the Harlequins' wrist-mounted kisses that punctured the fine weak points of the renegade marine's armour, the Corsairs were no match and barely had time to react at all before they were elegantly slaughtered. Ultimately though, it would be the Dark Angel's Fallen Angel Cypher who would release Gulliman, a figure that was shadowy and is very difficult to summarise here in short form. It's well enough that he is a controversial figure for the Imperium. With Chaos forces continuing to battle and surround the fortress, the Loyalists had few options as to how to escape and after securing their war gear, they made for the Eldar Webway Gate that was located at the centre of the Blackstone Fortress and had allowed the Harlequins to initially <laughs> enter this location. Now, however, reaching this was becoming ever more difficult as the Chaos forces had begun to become aware of what was transpiring. Things were looking darker and hope was fading but the forces, even with the support of the powerful Grey Knights, the Primarch Astartes, Skitarian Harlequins. The combined sheer volume of them was not enough to combat the power of the Chaos forces that now choked the corridors of the fortress. There was simply too much even for this powerful loyalist force and the variety of unique individuals it held. However, their salvation would be delivered through the hands of shadowy, ghostly figures who emerged from spectral fire erupting around the Chaos defenders. Clad in black and bone, embellished armour with the fabled and mythical Legion of the oh, Damned. A force of rarely seen and greatly really? feared warriors whose origin and goals for many throughout the galaxy are a myth and a mystery. Staying in line with what is known of the Legion, they always appear at critical moments in battle where all can be won or lost. And for the Loyalists, this instance was no exception. Unleashing devastating fire upon the shocked Chaos forces, the black skeletal figures wrapped in the fire that licked around their armour, a path was quickly punched through the Chaos forces, allowing Gulliman's force to advance quickly through. Yet now another massive battle would ensue as they reached the central chamber of the Blackstone the Fortress, some 100 miles in diameter. The Loyalists would now endure a battle against both forces of Zinch wow. and Korn combined. Voldus and his Grey Knights would lead an eviscerating advance, cutting through demons and chaos forces alike, with Dread Knights raining down crushing, furious blows of burning purity <laughs> on the abominations of the war. While the spectral warriors of the Legion of the Damned held a solid rearguard to prevent chaotic forces fully surrounding the Loyalists, Harlequins spun all around them, cutting through the horrors of the Immaterium with grace and ease. While the Imperium's combined force of Grey Knights, Skitari, Inquisition and other Astartes continued their shunting, punching, solid assault through wow. the enemy. As the fighting became ever more intense, with a greater demon of corn now leaping across the battle to crash down upon the last of the Black Templars, soon to turn his attentions to the Legion of the Damned, sweeping them aside as broken embers. Gulliman could see things were beginning to quickly unravel. and so they would make a final desperate push for the webway portal. 
Awaiting the last of the Imperial forces, Gulliman would find himself engaged with the demon in a circling whirlwind of flame. But now, having to fight the demonic rage that was building in the Primarch, he was losing control of his legendary composition, and it was only when he was able to push down these unnatural feelings of rage and strengthen his mind that he could attain the clarity to disengage from the demon and, using the Emperor's sword, strike it back. In a final shot of perfect execution, the Primarch would fire his few remaining bolts at the demon, who was now apoplectic at the Emperor's son, evading his grasp and his glory. The Primarch's bolts from his pistol met the black sword of the Black Templars that had been embedded in the demon, and the blade would shatter, shredding and rending wow. the demon apart. With this final feat, the Loyalists would enter the web. <laughs> Very adventurous. The Grey Knights had taken the most minimal of losses compared to many of the other Loyalist elements of the Primarch's force. For obvious reasons, their martial skills and invulnerability to demonic assault stood to protect them well. But this journey so far had been fraught with failure from start to finish. This crusade to terror is a good example of how, despite the Grey Knights' legendary powers and discipline, they're still only capable of so much. When facing devastating numbers of enemy, they can only engage so many at a time, and so impressive as they are, they are far from invincible or able to save all situations. The Grey Knights have a very specific function within the Imperium, albeit a function that they excel at, and are best employed as a precision tool more than a heavy hitting hammer. The Loyalists and their attached troop of Eldar now find themselves in a vague, incomprehensible space where their surroundings made little sense the webway. Eldar scouts were reporting back saying there were signs of heavily armed Chaos Marines wearing blue and gold. The undeniable description of the Zinch Chaos Marines of Magnus the Red wow. and the Thousand Sons. Gulliman needed assistance to see his way out of this situation. It was clear that Magnus and his sons were plotting some incursion, but he couldn't see the truth of it. One thing he was sure of though was that this had been orchestrated by Magnus and that the forces of Zinch had allowed them to escape to this webway portal and that there was still yet a bigger event at stake that they had to urgently reveal. The Grey Knight Master, Aldric Voldus, would again display his indispensable role, drawing on the knowledge and wisdom of the Grey Knight's Titan libraries. He would recall that there was a warded entrance within the webway to the Imperial Palace, and this was closed with any number of powerful psychic seals, but the fact of the situation they found themselves in led Voldus to surmise that this seemed a very likely threat that couldn't be ignored. With this information, Gulliman made the leap in understanding that Magnus likely knew of the webway gate location, and hoped that it was going to be unlocked to allow Gulliman passage, and that he was intending to use this as a way to enter terror, that he could exploit this opportunity and break through to strike at the very heart of the Imperium. Reaching terror now seemed an impossible task. They couldn't risk attempting to use the gate and allowing Magnus and his forces access to terror. Before they could safely reach their destination though, they were beset on all sides by the rubric marines of the Thousand Sons, who were bolstered by the horrific Zinch demons known as Zangos. Aldric Voldus and his Grey Knights would lead in engaging these abominations and wreak havoc against the creatures of the warp and traitors alike, Man. smashing their bodies and obliterating them with arcs of whirlwind speed, battering the automaton marines to clouds of dust and burning and shredding the demons with purity and psychic fire. Despite the passionate fight being displayed by his forces, Gulliman knew they had to get out of this situation as they had no other means of escape, nor could they afford to be trapped here for any length of time. The Eldar would now again assist the Loyalists by opening a webway gate that had lain secret for millennia, a gate and webway path leading directly to Luna, the natural moon of terror. Their journey though was only partly successful because despite their best efforts to evade Magnus, he was still able to partially breach their webway path back to Luna as Rubric Thousand Suns Marines tumbled out of the webway gate, driven and controlled by Chaos Sorcerers on their flying discs. And here on the surface of the moon, with Earth shining in the background, they battled across its wow. death strewn surface. Voldus and his Grey Knights would lead this fight using their powerful psychic abilities to resist the Rubric Marines of the Thousand Suns, the mindless automatons that were once the Thousand Suns of Marines, but now fight as puppets for their sorcerous commanders. 
Wow. Voldus and his Grey Knights would hold a major battle until reinforcements could arrive to finally banish Magnus and his chaotic forces back into the runway gate. Voldus would rip and literally tear them to pieces with the psychic fury of his mind and the loyalists would see what the true strength and power of the Grey Knights was on this day. The Thousand Suns piled in heaps of shredded armour in the craters of Luna, aided by the remnants of Eldar Harlequins who cut through the living and the animated alike. Now though, the Loyalists would face the demon Primarch of the Thousand Suns, Magnus the Red. Winged and wrapped in purple flame, his forces were without warning now able to push forward, seemingly immune to all that was thrown against them, and Magnus was enveloping them with psychic shields. Many Loyalists were sent reeling and crushed under the weight of this advance, shattering them and leaving some at the mercy of the demonic hordes. Even for the Grey Knights in their dread night, they were unable to counter such a powerful wow. champion of the warp. He sent them reeling, burning out their psychic wards and crushing their exposed armour. Tearing through reality with his staff, he would unleash waves of Zinch demons from the exposed warp that crashed like a wave of cackling nightmares upon the ever more precarious Loyalist forces. Gulliman could again see things were quickly turning against them and could not allow Magnus to win this battle least of all because of its proximity to Terra and the Emperor. As the Primarch soared high with his flaming blade of the Emperor, Magnus attempted to retaliate with incantations, but too late. Gulliman struck down on the traitor, and Magnus, while able to parry it, could not withstand the focused fury of the Ultramarine's master as the blow took Magnus reeling backward and out wow. of the center of the fight. Facing off against one another and battling a vicious close quarter fight of sparking blades <laughs> and blue energy bursts of psychic so flame dodging and weaving, the two brothers battled on until Gulliman was able to deliver a powerful thundering uppercut. Taken aback by this assault, Magnus and Gulliman would speak to the misconceptions of the other as to their loyalties, but it would take Magnus only moments to reassert his focus in the service of the Dark Entities. And this time, Gulliman would take the brunt of a violent downward thrust by Magnus and his glaive, engulfing the Primarch with agonizing psychic flame. Leaping from the certainty of death, Gulliman was able to escape this psychic punishment, only for Magnus to rend metal from a broken ship wreckage that littered the surface of Luna, bringing it crushing down and burying the wounded Lord of Ultramar. But he would not be defeated, not on this day, and not again fail in his duties to the Emperor and the Imperium, not by these puppets of the dark creatures of the Immaterium. Gulliman burst up through the Tomb of Wreckage, and throwing aside massive chunks of metal debris, he leapt out back into the fray. Surging with fury and newfound strength, Gulliman set his eyes on Magnus, who seeing the Primarch so soon after he'd buried him was taken aback. But as he readied a new spell to hurl at Gulliman, the skies would burst with fire. What happened? Grandmaster Voldus would see this sight and praise the Emperor, as Imperial fire would begin to rain down upon the enemies of mankind. The Grey Knights and other Loyalists had held unbreakable defensive bastions against the nightmarish hordes, but now the golden relief they sought was delivered to them, and the tide would begin to turn in their favour. The Imperial Navy and Adeptus Custodes had arrived to rain down wow. on the Dark Entities with energy and physically shattering bombs, tearing through the hordes of Zinch Entities nice. and Rubric Marines alike. As the Custodes arrived to begin engaging the enemy, Aldrich Volder seized this moment to turn their defence into an offence, and he and his psychically attuned Battle Brothers would roar out onto the battlefield, delivering burning fury to the now shell-shocked forces of Chaos. Voldus would lead his Grey Knights and Dread Knights in a powerful charge, rending through the enemy, his poor nemesis force weapon smashing apart demons and traitors alike. Psychic lightning danced all Very around the night as they became a truly holy sight to behold, their purity protecting them from any possible counter by the Zinch hordes and chaos sorcerers. The Knights of the Emperor and the Sigilite would make these horrors of the warp understand what true horror was. They continued to battle through the swathes of enemy crushing the rubric marines into piles of compacted, crushed metal and dust, while simultaneously burning away the souls and manifestations of the warp, literally tearing their spirits apart with psychic fury and white-hot purity, their very presence burning and irradiating all that dared to assault them. 
As bright yellow drop pods began to smash into the surface of the moon and Imperial Fists Astartes began to burst out onto the surface, <laughs> altars blazing and rapid fire volumes against the traitors and whirling sorcerers, Imperial victory was assured. Through the help of the Elder and the Custodes who had arrived as well as squads from the Sisters of Silence, Magnus's powers could be somewhat curtailed, allowing Gulliman to finally battle the demonic entity on a more even field of battle. Their one-on-one -on -one fight raged on, but through the whispers of the Eldar, Gulliman was able to coordinate his exhausting assault on Magnus, not allowing him any opportunity to compose himself, both injured and both nearing the limits of their abilities, giving one another not even an inch of breathing space, the Primarch laid down blow after blow upon Magnus, finally slamming into Magnus with a crashing shoulder blow to the chest, which sent Magnus spiralling down. Finally, with one massive last assault, Gulliman would roar in rage, hatred and fierce loyalty to the Imperium of Man as he drove forward, slipping Magnus's guard and embedding the burning sword through wow. the chest of the traitor Primarch. Magnus, screaming in burning agony, would unleash a counter shockwave of uncontrollable psychic fury that sent Gulliman and his blade reeling backward. Magnus himself, though, was also sent stumbling back from the power of this shockwave unwittingly into the webway gate. The plan that the Eldar had seen was all playing out, and now breaking the runestone, they severed the webway gate, leaving Magnus cut off and banished. Had Magnus been destroyed? Gulliman wished it so, but he did not believe it. <laughs> Voldus, his brothers and other allies would return to, to the uh, Imperial Palace on speech. Terra, where in front of the Imperial Eternity Gate, many would reach out in sheer awe to the returning Primarch, as well as the Grey Knights, and Grand Master. Gulliman would now be able to take his place as Lord Commander of the Imperium and prepare a massive counter-offensive against the forces of Chaos. There would be little doubt that Aldric Voldus and the Grey Knight's Order would join the Primarch and now leader of the Imperium in this quest to face down the darkness of the Chaos forces and reap a terrible vengeance upon them. The scale of their task, given the dire nature of events, looked insurmountable, but this was the dawn of a new dark period in Imperial history. The Grey Knights have the power and purity to resist all that the darkest entities of the warp can unleash upon humanity, and so, in these darkest and most uncertain of times, it is the Grey Knights who stand as the unmovable force as spoken in the Emperor's own words. They are my bulwark against the terror, they are my space marines, and huh. they shall know no fear. Well, there you go. So that was Luton Nines uh, Grey Knights Part 2. And that was requested by Jake Wu. Uh, thank you for requesting that. If you aren't watching Luton Nines stuff, there's a link in the description to help you find it. So go check it out. Pretty in informational stuff. What I learned, um, well, it went into details about the specific weapons they were carrying, like a bolter on the arm so they could carry uh, two-handed psychic-powered weapons. That is super cool. Um, personal transportation devices, portals. Incredible. Um, the fact that most of them who aren't using the portal devices, apparently, are wearing the super super armor uh, what was it is it Terminator uh, that's cool um, 
and then we learned about this magnificent battle that all involved the Ultramarines on uh, their quest to try to make it back to Terra. Uh, which involves so many groups. So many awesome groups. Um, it even even had the, the Harlequin, which is interesting. Uh, I wonder what their motives behind that was. Because you gotta know they had motives. Anyways, my thoughts on it. What an incredible group. Um, and what an incredible story to end it off with. See, I, I, I saw it was longer. It was like, oh, great. More, more logistics. But no. It, and ended it with a, a big, brutal battle scene that was quite descriptive. It was very nice. So, I think I'm going to leave it at that. So, Lily, out. If you like the video, stay tuned for more content. And as always, feel free to comment. Have a good one.